Thank you so much. It's such a privilege and a pleasure for my husband and me to be with you this weekend. I always feel as though we are the major beneficiaries of the blessings that come. And at the outset, since I am speaking in a church sanctuary to a mixed group, I would like to say at the outset that I I'm not in favor of women preachers. I don't want to be a woman a woman preacher, and I think I know my place. We women have the privilege of not being in charge of things, and what a privilege and freedom and liberation that is. I, I come under the authority of Christ, of course, under the authority of his word, under the authority of the church, and I never speak in a mixed group in a church unless there is a man in charge of the meeting, and of course under also the authority of my husband. So it is a privilege and a pleasure to talk about a subject very close to my heart. What is a disciple? A disciple, the word comes from the same word, obviously, as discipline. It means learning. A disciple is a learner. And the definitive passage that I'd like to read is Matthew 16, verse 21. Jesus is predicting his death. Matthew 16, 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And on the third day, he would be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Another translation uses the word disciple there. If any man, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must give up his right to himself and take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good would it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul. So my question to you this morning would be, do you want to be his disciple? And Jesus makes it plain that this is a choice. This is an opportunity to exercise the freedom of will that God created in us when he made us human beings. And he's only one of many traveling rabbis in his day. He simply says, if you want to be my disciple, these are the conditions. If you don't want to be my disciple, you can find plenty of others to follow, plenty of others at whose feet you can be a learner. But if you want to be my disciple, the, these are the conditions. The first thing that you must do is to deny yourself, give up your right to yourself, leave self behind. Imagine trying to sell that idea in our present society. I don't think it's sold very well in Jesus' day. I don't think it's ever likely to sell very well, but I doubt that there's ever been a time when the disease of self-culture has ever been so prevalent and so endemic as it seems to be today. The world is telling us continually how important it is to examine ourselves and build up our self-esteem and all the rest of it. And Jesus starts with a startling imperative. 
and it's interesting that he's not just talking to the disciples here, he's talking to crowds. He said this in several different gospels in different places, but essentially the same conditions were given, whether it was the intimate group of his disciples or the crowds. You must give up your right to yourself and then take up the cross and follow. And I see the giving up the right to oneself as a no and the taking up of the cross as a yes and the following as just simple, humble, daily, faithful obedience. And obedience is the only valid test of the reality of our faith. There really isn't any other valid test. Jesus said, if you love me, do what I say. Why do you call me Lord and do not the things that I say? Well, if your answer is yes to the question, you really want to be a disciple, the enemy is instantly at your elbow with wise warnings, seemingly wise warnings. Remember what Peter said to Jesus. He said probably exactly what I would have said, probably what you would have said. No, Lord, that must not happen to you. We can't handle this for you to go up there and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and chief priests and be killed. We, we can't stand the idea. And Jesus' retort was, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking as God thinks. You're thinking as men think. And that is our problem all the time, isn't it? That's our temptation, constantly to think as men think. And it's very difficult not to allow the world around us to squeeze us into its mold. Paul warned the Roman Christians that they must not do that, but they didn't have the mass media in those days. If it was a tough job to fend off the thinking of the world, then what is it for us now? Well, it's an old problem. It just may be exacerbated by the mass media, but we, we need to learn to think as God thinks. So the enemy is there immediately when you say, yes, I want to be a disciple, and he says, wait a minute, you have things to deal with first. A whole lot of things you need to deal with before you make any such rash decision as that. And this reminds me of Jesus' parable of the sower. The seed falls on all kinds of ground. Some of it falls on the footpath. And I see the footpath as representing the well-worn paths of the world, notions which are generally accepted by the world. Then there are the rocks which give no staying power to the seed, and there are the thistles, the worries of this world, or we would call them problems today, wouldn't we? We are problem-oriented, and everybody's got problems. And Satan is there to remind us that we've got a lot of things to take care of before we can do anything so rash as becoming a disciple of Jesus. And then there is a seed that falls on the good soil. That is the man who hears the word and welcomes it and bears fruit. Now, to me, one of the simplest illustrations of what discipleship is all about is a college athlete or a high school athlete, let's say. I lived across the street from a high school in Massachusetts, and I could not believe my eyes when I would look out there on a sleeting or raining or snowy day in November, let's say, the most miserable month in Massachusetts. And here would be this bunch of kids flinging themselves face down into the mud or throwing themselves at each other which, with tremendous force, obviously painful. And there was a man out there yelling and screaming his head off at these kids. And I thought, now, if this were not a voluntary activity that these kids were indulging in, that man would be arrested for child abuse. <laughs> I mean, it is absurd, the tortures that they voluntarily put themselves under. But the great thing, the great difference about that and child abuse is that these kids choose to do this. Now why? 
do they put themselves under that kind of pain simply because they want to play football. And football is somebody else's thing. There's a rule book and there's a coach and there is a particular size field with particular kind of goal posts and a particular shaped ball and nobody is going to play it his own way. If you go out there on that field to do your own thing, you're not going to play football, that's all there is to it. You are going to do exactly what the coach says and you're going to do it when he says and you're going to do it the way he says or you won't be playing football. In other words, the athlete comes to the coach essentially with an empty cup. He says, here I am, I'll do anything you say. I don't know anything, I don't have anything, I am nothing, but here I am, I want to play football. And he becomes a disciple. He is a learner. He comes with no private agenda. And Jesus asks us to give up our right to ourselves. And these kids are giving up their right to the comfort, to the freedom of after-school hours, to grueling Saturdays, voluntarily. My second husband, Addison Leach, was the dean of a college, of one college, and the vice president of another college, and had a lot of experience with college kids. And he used to say that the happiest kids on any campus were always the athletes and the musicians. Why? Well, because they are kids who have put themselves voluntarily under severe discipline. Nobody has to be in the marching band or the orchestra, but if they want to be in the marching band or the orchestra or on the football team, they put themselves voluntarily under somebody else's tutelage and they do what he says. The orchestra is a harmony. They're playing somebody else's music and they are playing under somebody else's direction and nobody does his own thing except in a very limited measure. There are positions on the football team and there are instruments in the orchestra, but very severely disciplined and limited in what they're allowed to do. They come and they say, show me. I'll do it, whatever you say. Now Jesus calls us, you and me, in the 1990s, on this particular Sunday morning in 1991, his call comes to us as it has come for more than 2,000 years, 2,000 years or slightly less. He says, leave self behind. I don't think we need a revision of that gospel. But Satan comes along with the same old time-worn and successful suggestions and says, be careful. Be very careful. And that was Peter's wisdom, wasn't it? Lord, We've got to stop this somehow. Let's not go to Jerusalem if this is what it's going to mean. Be careful. And what does Jesus say? Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find his true self. That's what Philip's translation says, will find his true self. We've all known young people who have put on a backpack and some waffle stompers and some blue jeans and have gone off to try to find themselves and they end up in Kathmandu or someplace and usually it's a dead end street. They haven't succeeded in finding themselves or much of anything else. And you remember the people that Jesus tells about in the parable who were called to a dinner party and one of them had bought a field and he couldn't come another one had bought a yoke of oxen and he had to go and check on them and somebody else had gotten married and then there was a rich young man who came to Jesus and asked what he must do to be saved and Jesus told him he must keep the commandments and he said well I've done that what else do I need to do and Jesus told him the one impossible thing sell everything you have and then come and follow me and the story is that he turned away 
sorrowful because he had great possessions. In other words, he was too rich to follow. And then there was the man who said to Jesus, I will follow you, I want to follow you, but let me bury my father first. Now there is nothing intrinsically evil about owning a field or a yoke of oxen or getting married or having a lot of money and certainly nothing wrong with burying your father. All of these things are completely legitimate things. Wise counsel, isn't it, for Satan to offer to us. It's very appealing. Be careful. Don't go overboard. Got to keep balanced. It's always balance, isn't it? Which 90, 99 times out of 100 for us Christians when we're talking about spiritual things means compromise. Now, these are all Satan's wiles. These are barriers, obstructions to obedience to Jesus Christ, to becoming disciples. And if you want to be a disciple, then the imperatives are categorical. Give up your right to yourself, take up the cross, and follow. Well, but I've got property, I've got a field, I've got work to do, I've got a livelihood, I have a wife, I have children, I have responsibilities, I've got money, I've got to be a, a faithful steward of all this, or I must go and bury my father, bury my past, perhaps. There's a whole lot of things back there in my past that are just recently coming up to the surface. And I've got to deal with these. I've got to dredge them up and examine them and chew over them and work through them and deal with them. And then perhaps I'll be in a position to take up the cross. Well, just yesterday, I happened to be in the bookstore here in town. And I saw a whole shelf full of things which could be ways of evading the clear and simple call. Please don't misunderstand me here, but the things that we have to deal with today are much more complicated, aren't they, than property and work and family responsibilities and money and burying one's father. And there they were, shelves and shelves and shelves of those A's, abuse, abandonment, alcohol, addiction, adultery, denial, dysfunctional, and victimization. Now there they were, books on all of these subjects, words that we hear every day. We can't escape them. I don't know what your problem may be, what you may think stands between you and this life of discipleship. But none of those things are new to God. And all of those things are spoken of in Isaiah 53. He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, all of them. He poured out his soul unto death in order to save us. And whatever salvation takes, that is what he is prepared to do. And he's, he's there. And so often when I speak, when I receive mail from my radio listeners, I'm asked to give them some kind of wisdom about all these awful things that I never have experienced. I didn't come from a dysfunctional family. Now, of course, if I tell you that I have never been abused as a child, I was not abandoned, my father was not an alcoholic, I, as far as I know, I'm not addicted to anything, um, I haven't committed adultery, I have not been victimized, then I know what they're going to tell me next. You're in denial. <laughs> right? And that is the worst thing of all. Well, so be it. When these people write to me and ask, ask me questions in meetings, all I can say is, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not even a psychologist, I'm not even very wise. I'm just an ordinary woman who reads her Bible, wants to love God, and wants to help other people to love God 
in any way that I can. But if you're asking me these questions, you're not going to get a psychological answer. I'm ignorant. I can only give you the answer that I find in the scriptures. And sometimes it comes through rather clearly in the letters that I get that people really are not looking for holiness. What they are looking for is solutions. Now, we can't, we can't always have both. There are a lot of things in life that God is not going to do anything about because he wants us to do something with them. And so I can ask people, do you, do you want solutions or do you really want holiness? Do you want to be his disciple or do you want to be comfortable and to have no, nothing more to worry about? as far as all of these things, which people seem to forget, were taken care of on the cross. Do you want answers, or do you want orders? And Jesus does not always give us answers. He gives us orders. If you want to come with me, this is the way. You must walk the way of the cross. Are you willing to understand if understanding may mean that you are going to have to rearrange your life? Are you willing to be healed? You remember the story of Jesus at the pool of Bethesda where there was a man who had been lying there for 38 years and Jesus asked him what seems a very strange question. A paralyzed man lying for 38 years by this healing pool and Jesus goes up and says, do you want to be healed? a piercing question, a penetrating question, because the man's reply gives us an indication that he really didn't want to be healed. He started with excuses. He didn't just say yes. He said, well, I've been here and I don't have anybody to put me into the pool and when the angel comes down, always somebody gets there before I do, hamming and hawing and finding refuge from the Son of God. And we have many ways of finding refuge from obedience to him. Do you want to be a disciple? It's going to mean that you will have to completely rearrange your life. It may mean that you are going to be healed of something which will deprive you of the sympathy that you have been enjoying. Some of us don't really want to be healed because it, there is a certain aura about the pain that everybody knows about and all of a sudden you're not the center of attention anymore. Well, we must give it all to God. We must strip ourselves of every excuse, every vestige of self-will and become a little child. And I'm not saying anything new today. The mystics, the saints throughout all the ages not to mention our master himself, said these same things. In Philippians, the second chapter, we read, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I have a hard time turning pages of this relatively new Bible here. Didn't put a marker in the right place. Verse 5, Philippians 2, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And it goes on to describe what his attitude was. Being in the very nature of God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. The word is annihilated himself. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that is the very reason why he is now highly exalted. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. 
as Richard Baxter wrote in the 17th century, Christ leads me through no darker rooms than he went through before. And so he says, do you want to be my disciple? Give up your right to yourself as I did. And of course he was telling the disciples this before he had gone to the cross. Paul has a fuller revelation. The disciples were such fools and slow of heart to believe, just like you and me. And again and again, Jesus had explained to them that he was going to be killed, he was going to rise again, and right up to the night of the crucifixion, they did not know what was happening. But Paul knew, in the, being in the very nature of God, he made himself nothing. Just think, the one who flung the stars into space, the one at whose voice creation sprang at once to sight, all the angel faces, all the hosts of light, thrones, dominions, kingdoms, all that those hands had made were submitted, surrendered into the hands of wicked men. And he was annihilated, nailed to a cross but it was a voluntary surrender. A voluntary surrender. And Jesus makes it clear that to follow him is a voluntary choice. But it involves surrender, sacrifice, and daily obedience. Taking up the cross and following. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And Jesus, on that last night, when he ate supper with the disciples, remember that the Bible says, in order to show the full extent of his love, he rose from supper and took a towel and washed the disciples' feet. Now, wouldn't you think that going to the cross would be sufficient proof of the full extent of his love? He washed feet in order to show his disciples that he was not talking about heroics. The taking up of, of the cross rarely looks like heroics. He was talking about the humblest, dirtiest, most demeaning job that a slave in an Eastern household had to do. And he said, this is what I, your Lord and Master, I'm doing for you, and you must do the same for each other. That's going to take death, annihilating yourself. And when I read that passage, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, I wonder how, in God's name, how can I help people to see this? What this means? How often I hear the phrase, what am I supposed to be, a doormat? And I read that he made himself nothing, not even a doormat. And he got down on his knees and Peter said just what you and I would have said again. He said, Lord, you washing my feet? He was their Lord, he was their master, and he said, if I, your Lord and Master, wash your feet. You call me Lord and Master. You say, what? well, you're, it's right, it's true. I am your Lord and Master. This is what a Lord and Master does. And so he, he was not giving them all the privilege of going to a literal cross and being nailed up there. He was giving them the privilege that every single one of us for the rest of human history is permitted and privileged to do for somebody else. A humble, hidden, menial task for which there will be no bronze plaques or honorary degrees. Do you want to be his disciple? Now this death business, can it possibly ever have been popular then? Of course not. The kind of death Jesus was to die was a cruel form of torture and it bore with it the most abject shame. What is it we think we're getting when we take up the cross? Something comfortable? Something fun? 
it cuts absolutely across our human will. And as someone has said, when the will of God crosses the will of man, somebody has got to die. Well, somebody already has, somebody with a capital S, but you and I have got to die all those thousands of little deaths that it takes to say no to ourselves. Now, we're not talking about morbidity or mutilation or suicide, but about abandoning the proprietorship of ourselves. Of ourselves. Someone has called it expropriation of the self, a total abandonment. Just as the, what I saw out there on the playing field in the mud and the rain and the sleet, a total abandonment of themselves in those high school kids for one shining object, the glory of being a football hero. A very remote possibility for most of them. But it was worth the effort. It was worth throwing themselves face down in the mud. Well, what is it that Jesus offers us? Something infinitely greater than the glory of being a football hero. What is your refuge this morning from the clear and simple imperative? The categorical imperative. You must give up your right to yourself and take up the cross and follow me. Now it comes right down to very ordinary and very humble things. My friend Terry became a Christian when she was a teenager. And she had always had more or less of a tense relationship with her mother. And she said, you know, it wasn't anything big, it wasn't any big deal, but teenage girls against their mothers, it was that kind of thing. And I was always arguing. Anything my mother said, I had an argument for. And she said, when I became a Christian, I started to read my Bible, as I was instructed to do. And she said, I came across a verse in the Bible that was going to be very inconvenient. The Bible has a way of being extremely inconvenient. And the verse said, honor your father and your mother. And she said, I sat there in my room and I thought, what does this mean? How am I supposed to honor them? Well, this girl was in earnest about following the Lord, and so she prayed that the Lord would show her what it meant. And not very long after that, she was invited to a party. And her parents, being loving, responsible parents, asked where the party was going to be. And when they found out, her mother said, no, you're not going to that party. And guess what Terry said? Okay. And she said, you know, I went into my room and I sat down on my chair and I said, my mother just told me I can't go to this party. And I said, okay, I guess God's answering my prayer. I'm honoring my mother. Now she had to give up her right to herself. That was the thing Terry wanted. But she voluntarily surrendered. And it gets right down where we live, doesn't it? The husband who decides that he wants to take up the cross and follow. He has a clear directive in Ephesians 5 of how he is to love his wife. It doesn't say anything about feelings in that passage. It doesn't say anything about looks. It says nothing about contingencies. If the wife is a nice, loving, lovable, submissive, sweet soul, then you are to love your wife in the following way. No, it says nothing at all about that to the husband. It says husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Now, what shape was the church in when Christ loved us? Well, pretty miserable. And it says that that love has got to be sacrificial. Is there a husband who finds that easy? Who in ordinary little daily humble things for which he is not going to be praised in the newspapers, he lays down his life for his wife. 
That's what it means to be obedient. Acceptance of responsibility to make her holy. How many of you gentlemen have thought seriously about the fact that God is going to hold you responsible for making your wife holy? That was the responsibility that Jesus took for his bride, the church. You wives, we are not told to submit to our husbands because they are so brilliant and so handsome and so strong and so much more spiritual than we are because they're always right. Now, those of you that saw my husband yesterday know that he is handsome, he's tall, he's a whole lot bigger than I am, he's physically much stronger than I am, he's a lot smarter than I am in a whole lot of ways, but he is not always right. <laughs> Every now and then, he makes a mistake. But my Bible says, wives submit yourselves to your husbands. Wives respect your husbands. Now what is it that I am to respect? The office that he holds. My husband holds an office. I didn't give it to him. He didn't achieve it. It is an assignment, a divine and inescapable assignment. He is my head. It doesn't say he ought to be, it doesn't say he ought to try to be, it doesn't say I ought to confer upon him the honor of being my head, it says he is my head. I can like it or I can lump it, but if I am going to be a disciple, I have got to take up the cross of submission. Now can you imagine, maybe some of you who have only been here this morning may imagine that I am a shrinking violet type. I think any of you who were here, were here Friday night and Saturday would by this time realize that I really am not a shrinking violet type who wants to be told what to do. A woman who can't make up her own mind and loves being told what to do. It has nothing to do with my temperament. It has nothing to do with competence. Let's get that straight, ladies. Submission is not an admission of inferiority. It is a command that I am to respect the office that my husband holds, which is headship. And one of the ways in which I have to say no to myself every day is keeping my mouth shut. One of my mottos is, never pass up an opportunity to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and there are a lot of those opportunities, and I pass up most of them, I'm afraid. Singles, do you want to be a disciple? Well, the severest test in my life came over this whole issue of singleness. I would say that that is the place where the cross cut into my heart. Deepest, piercing pain. And I believe that for most young people this is, this is true. If Jesus Christ is not Lord of your love life, he is not Lord. And it was when I was a college student that I found myself falling madly in love with a man that I had absolutely no reason for thinking would ever look at me twice. This man was what we used to call a BMOC, a big man on campus, or a BTO, a big time operator. I mean, this guy, Jim Elliott, was everything. You know, he was handsome, he was smart, he was a campus clown, the kind of guy that could stand up and do comedy at a moment's notice. He was president of the Foreign Missions Fellowship, so he was a spiritual leader on the campus. He was a champion wrestler, won the championship of four states in his weight class, and he graduated with highest honor in classical Greek. Quite a guy, you know, a dreamboat as we girls thought. I don't know what the word is now, I guess hunk has been outdated. And <laughs> I'm not up on all that, but... Uh, I found myself falling in love with this guy. Just at the point where I had said to the Lord, if you want me to be single for the rest of my life, Lord, I'll take it. Because I wanted to be a disciple. I really did. I still do. And I had sung a hundred times, where he leads me, I will follow. And it's great to sing missionary hymns over mountain and plain and sea, but the chances are that God's not going to ask you to go over mountains and plains and seas. He's going to ask you to start being a disciple 
in the hidden place, in the place where nobody's looking except maybe your wife or your husband. And so I had said to the Lord, yes, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to take up the cross. Is the cross permanent singleness? And the Lord didn't give me an answer to that. He just said, would you be willing for that? Well, Lord, uh, it's not my idea of what I'd like, and you certainly know that I would love to have a husband and a family and children, as well as to be a foreign missionary, which I was thrilled to believe God had called me to be. But, Lord, if that's what you want, then yes, my answer is yes. You'll have to give me the grace. And then I fall in love with this man. And then I discovered just before I graduated from college, just a few weeks before my graduation, that this man had fallen in love with me, which blew my mind. That was a stunning piece of news. But I was even more thunderstruck when he followed that piece of news with the announcement that he believed that God was calling him to be single, perhaps for the rest of his life. And so, in effect, he's saying, yes, I love you. Yes, I'd love to have you for a wife, but you go ahead and go to Africa. I'm going to South America. See you around. Wasn't much chance I would see him around. I was graduating. He wasn't. I lived in New Jersey. He lived in Portland, Oregon. I was going to Africa. He was going to South America. But years before, I had prayed the prayer of Betty Scott Stam, a great missionary to China. Lord, I give up all my own plans and purposes, all my own desires and hopes, and accept thy will for my life. I give myself, my life, my all utterly to thee to be thine forever. Fill me with thy Holy Spirit. Use me as thou wilt. Send me where thou wilt. Work out thy whole will in my life at any cost, now and forever. And so it's a long story. I won't tell you the rest of it, but as you know, since my name is Elizabeth Elliot, we did end up together, Jim and I, but it didn't last very long. Jim died after 27 months of marriage. And discipleship is always a death which is experienced and freely undergone, a daily and hourly no to the self. But it's not morbidity, it's not suicide, it's not mutilation, it is joy. And ladies and gentlemen, I am here to testify with all my heart as a woman who has sought to follow the Lord for more than 50 years. Every single time I have ever said no to myself and yes to God, it has without exception led ultimately to joy. Doesn't mean that I evade the deep waters and the hot fires and the valley of the shadow of death. But it does mean that beyond those there is joy and in the midst of the deepest waters and the hottest fires and the valley of the shadow of death I have known peace. Peace I leave with you, Jesus said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Yes to God in a humble, honest, faithful carrying out of what God has given me to do. That's what following means. Do you want to be a disciple? The first condition is to say no to yourself. The second is to say yes to God. And from there on, the course of your life is a daily, hourly following, which will involve the yes and the no every day of the world. But the end product is joy. The end product is joy. We give up ourselves, that poor, ragged, disreputable, whining, offended, bankrupt self. And what does he give us? Himself. My life verse. That the greatness of Christ may shine out in me, whether it be by life or by death, for to me, life is Christ, and to die is gain. God bless you.